Welcome back to the homestead. This week has been a cold one, and that's pretty much the theme of this entire episode. Um, just a few days back, I woke up to frost on the ground, and it was a very light frost, a very delicate frost, but it made me realize it's pretty late in the season, and it got really cold in general. Like, we had some really unseasonably warm weather, and that kind of threw off my internal clock, calendar. Um, it made me think it was sort of just little, not quite as late into summer or into fall as it really is. So when I looked at, finally looked at an actual calendar, I realized that we were actually at, we were past our average frost state for this area. So that's like, I should expect some frost. <laughs> so it was a very light frost, but it did take a toll on some things in the garden. Some things are, are kicking some serious ass. Um, like the blueberry cherry tomatoes. I am so impressed. I'm going to talk more about them in a little bit, but man, they're doing great. And I've left, I really should be pulling up the garden because I want to create some more of those Hugel Tower. Um, and I want to be able to have a place to put them and start filling them because I'd like to get that done before the snow falls. But it's, uh, I've left, let the garden go because even the things that were kind of hit by frost are still putting out flowers and the bees could use any pollen source they can get their hands on. So I've been hesitant to pull up the garden, even though I really need to. So it's been a weird balance because um, it's all about the bees, especially this week. We, um, when, we, when I got the frost, I realized I think it's time to winterize the hive. So I actually bought um, some, some of this sort of insulation. Basically, it's bubble wrap covered in tin foil. is the best way I can describe it. But I went back and forth about what I was going to do for... It's actually, oh, that'll make a cool thumbnail. <laughs> so um, I was actually going back and forth about, you know, what materials, how am I going to winterize, what materials I'm going to use. And a lot of people suggest like the rigid, rigid foam insulation, kind of like the big blue blocky stuff. And I was considering that. But then uh, another winterizing project I have to do in the house is actually we have um, our house. Like I, I always talk about it's very old, but it's somewhere along the line. They built sort of like two add-ons. One is our kitchen and one is our basically our laundry room. Um, and they're in these, it has these crawl spaces underneath and the, the wind is gonna seriously mess with my hair. It's been very windy out too. The last few days, very cold wind. So, uh, so anyway, there's these crawl spaces and the draft comes up through them and the cold air and it's just kind of awful during the winter. So one of the things we're doing to winterize is use that. This stuff is actually made. It's one of the things it's used for. You actually put it two layers of it to create sort of like an insulating air pocket in crawl spaces. So that's primarily why I bought it. We're also thinking about putting in some of our windows because we have these really old windows and eventually we'd, when we have the money we want to replace them all. So it's just these super old obnoxious windows. So we may actually cut some of that insulation just to help block the draft. That's in addition to putting you know the good old plastic wrap on the windows and putting on in, we just bought a ton of heavy curtains because we have these curtains on some windows. We noticed last year that they do really, really well. They're like, I guess technically light blocking curtains, but the material's really thick too. So it blocked out a lot of the draft and a lot of the chill and it made rooms that had them significantly. So we just went ahead and spent the money and got them all. And eventually we're gonna, when I win the lottery or become super famous doing something, hopefully appropriate, that will actually exchange out all the windows. But that's boring house stuff. You don't want to hear about that. Let's talk about the bees. So there's a few things I want to do with the bees. And I took the time. Okay, well, first of all, I needed a follower board to shrink the hive. Because when I checked on the hive, I wasn't super thrilled about what I saw in there. When I looked in there, I was so hoping by the end of this season, I would every frame would be filled out with comb and full of nectar and honey and pollen and brood and everything, well, maybe not brood, but um, everything would be amazing and they'd have lots of supplies to get them through the long winter we have here. I didn't see that. Now, in all fairness, about two thirds of the, two, about two thirds of the frames did have, were drawn out mostly and had at least something in there, uh, some nectar or pollen or brood, and at least in a few cases. So I was like, okay, that's pretty good. That's not too bad. Um, they really didn't do as good as I had hoped, but that's fine. So the first step I needed to do was reduce the hive down because if I can create a small space as possible that they need to keep warm, I know that they technically just keep their little ball warm, but just in general, having a space kind of warm would be nice. And smaller is easier to keep warm. So 
I actually created a, a follower board, an insulated follower board, by um, taking a, an extra frame I had, wrapping it in this material, and I think I have an image of that I'll show, and sticking it in the hive. Okay, sticking it in the hive after I removed all the, the hives, uh, all the frames that didn't really have any comb drawn on them. There are a few that had that, or very little comb, like a little tiny piece. And I just completely removed that. I did put frames back in that were, that didn't have, that were drawn out but didn't have anything in them. And I just stuck them in the back of the hive just for that much more material in the hive because I was concerned about, yes, that, it, that follow board might be insulated and they might have a nice small space to live in. But the back of the hive, I didn't want to leave empty. I wanted to have something in there, so at least some material. It might not be as drafty. That's my understanding, at least in terms of, like, supers. Instead of having an empty super on top, having a super, even if it's has nothing of value in it, it's good to still have it there because it's that much more material and that less space to try to keep warm. So hopefully I will be able to share pictures to illustrate what I did. So I moved all good frames to the front of the hive and bad, bad frames, empty frames, to the back. And in between, I put that insulated follower board. Now on top, I have, of course, the inner cover. Then I put down another sheet of that reflective, Reflectex, I think it's called, insulation. And then I put some scrap wood um, on top of that and put another piece of that insulation on the inside of the, the outer cover. So if you can picture it, it's, you know, inner cover, insulation, wood. And the pieces of wood are there to keep the cover up a little bit so that it has an air pocket because this, this material is particularly insulating when there's an air pocket trapped in between two layers of this. And then, of course, you know, more of the insulation and the outer cover. So I created this nice little sandwich that hopefully will, one, that material reflects the heat back to wherever the heat's coming from. So the heat rising up from the bees inside will be reflected back. And two, will create it with that extra air pocket will create an insulating layer. Hopefully that was clear. So... When that all is said and done, they should have a nice little contained area that they need to keep warm that's fairly insulated. Will I do anything else? Um, yes, I did do something else. So before I get to other things, I also took another panel of that reflective insulating um, material and put it on the underside of the hive. Now, the, the, this long Langstroth hive has a screened bottom. And I, I went to a local beekeeper's and I was like, okay, so do you, do you leave your screen open? And people are like, yeah, totally. But the thing is, a lot of them have normal Langstroth hives where the screen is only like, you know, yay big because it has a small footprint because their hives are tall. Mine's long, so it's a big area to have open with screen. And the other thing being, a lot of people that had screen bottoms still had a solid bottom. So it didn't just empty, the screen didn't just open up to the ground. In my case, it did. Like, if there's little mites that fall or anything, the feces, it just falls through the screen onto the ground underneath the hive. So they kind of had something that already blocked the draft, and I'm like, so people are telling me, oh, yeah, leave it, leave the screen open. Don't try to cover that up. It's all good. And I'm like, yeah, but you have a very different situation. So I took a piece of that material, and it covers up mostly. So ideally, the heat that they're generating if it will bounce off that and comes back up at them. It blocks off some of the draft. Now, it isn't a perfect fit, so I believe it will create at least a little bit of a draft for ventilation. That's what I'm hoping. Um, but yeah, so that's what I also, also what I did. So are there more things I can do? Now, some people talk about wrapping the hive, and I have tons of it with tar paper that you would use for roofing, or I guess felt technically is what it is. And I have a bunch of that from when I did the chicken coop roof, and we actually, I actually found some in the barn from when they last did the actual house. So I had a ton of this material, so I could wrap the hive. Now, the, the concept behind that is wrapping the, the hive in this material will create something that will absorb the sun's heat. Um, because the way I have the, the hive positioned is that it has a lot of shade during the summer, but during the winter when all the leaves fall, it should get some, a lot of direct sunlight. So that could help heat up the hive. I might do that. I haven't done it yet. I'm still debating because some people are not keen on that idea in this area. So I'm still, gonna, I'm still thinking that out, so I'm not really sure. But the bees, I think, are doing okay. They're, right now, they're kicking out the drones. I mean, it's two-thirds of the hive, so that's, I mean, it's pretty good. I guess I can't complain. I did see brood. I didn't see a queen, but I saw a little bit of brood. And I saw a good amount of nectar and pollen, so I hope they make it. I'm still feeding them. I still have the feeders out, but it's been super cold, so they haven't come out of the hive much. So 
I don't know. I don't know. But I just, I just want them to survive the winter. I just want peace to survive the winter. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but I'm not counting my bees before they're hatched. So after that was done, I moved on to another winter project or fall project I, I want to be doing, which is clearing some land. So at this time of year, a lot of the trees that I don't really care to keep, like the ash trees and whatnot, have lost all their leaves or most of their leaves. So they look like skeletons, so they really stand out. The maples are all turning color, and some have lost their leaves, but they're still in that transition period. And then the oaks haven't even changed color or done anything yet. So it's like a perfect time to get rid of the trees I don't really like. So I went through and I cut down a bunch of ash trees and a bunch of like other junk trees that I don't really know but I don't find useful. And just in case you're not familiar with what I consider useful, um, uh, oak trees or acorns, both because that is a potential protein source if I dare collect and soak them and remove the tannins and all that stuff. Also attracts deer in case I care to hunt at some point or just generally want to live wildlife around. And it's starting to rain. Awesome. That's what I need. So, uh, so those are the two primary things I want to keep around. I do have a ton of sugar. Oh, I only said one. The other one being maple, sugar maple. And I have tons of those two types of trees. So I'm trying to keep those wherever I can. That tree that fell on my garden many weeks, months back, that was a maple. In retrospect, I probably shouldn't just have cut it down. I should have cut it maybe just short so it could pull lard and still be alive. I sort of did that even with the junk trees that I cut down. Um, I cut down about 10. I tried to sort of kind of pull lard them. I don't really care if they survive or not, but if they do, great. Um, but I'm basically clearing that area because I want to put nut trees. I'm going to grow nut trees over there and that other pasture. That's my plan. And I kind of thought about putting them in a row, kind of like an orchard. But then I was realizing, you know, everywhere I'm cutting down these ash trees and other junk trees are opening up these spaces where these perfectly good and big trees were growing. So do I have to really... I'm such an engineer. Like, I, I like things fairly organized. You wouldn't know by perhaps my insane hair half the time. But I like to keep things fairly organized. So I always go to these, like, oh, i got to put in rows, i got to put in squares, and everything's got to be perfectly measured. And maybe I don't have to do that. Maybe I'm going to escape from that. I'm going to have to at some point because I'm... There's only so far I can expand, really. You know, I've already run into some areas that I've cleared, hoping to put new gardens, and had weird topological er like areas, kind of actually where I cut down that big maple. I cut it down so I could put more garden space there and realized that it's kind of like on this hill and without serious heavy equipment, which I don't own and I can't really afford to even rent, I can't, I can't flatten that to put in, like, make it good garden space. So... It may just be I gotta learn to work with the land instead of fighting it. I guess that I'm learning permaculture through lack of funds. Not having the money means you can't afford to do this crazy stuff to radically change things. So we have to just work with the land. So maybe plant things there, you know, and just kind of break away from the grid that I kind of got myself into. I will have a grid a little bit. Like I said, I'm building those Google Tower sort of compost ring raised beds that are going in lines and, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff, and which I'll get back into in a moment, because I actually just transplanted a bunch of plants in rows. So I'm very excited. But first, before I get to that, the cutting down of the trees. So it got really, really windy. The wind picked up, and it got really dangerous. And I learned my lesson from that maple tree, that cutting down large trees in the wind is not smart. So I stopped. I put away my chainsaw. I was like, all right, I'm done. I took down 10 to 12 trees. That was a pretty good day in terms of felling. And they're just sort of like laying there in a mess over in that pasture. But I'll clean those up eventually. But I, uh, I decided to walk around my property and start marking the... Just I use Google Maps and the GPS on there, try to keep it as accurate as possible, to just see where my property lines are, like really get a feel for them. Because next year, if I start developing the land more, I want to know where my boundaries are, where I need to stop, or what area I have to work with if I, say, create a bunch of deer-friendly habitat and things like food plots and like watering holes and bedding and all that kind of stuff. So I went along the north, uh, the west side, which has no obvious markers. And I started tying fluorescent rope, lengths, uh, little bits of fluorescent length. And I just went every, I don't know, quite a few feet. Like, I just want a general idea of being able to where it is. I might go back in there. I probably will go back in there and post, post posted no hunting, no trespassing signs. And I'll explain why in a moment. But um, I followed that 
that border all the way up. Now the 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 north, oh wait, the south, <laughs> the south border and the east um, are fairly obvious. There's these old like stone walls that more or less mark the boundary. Um, over on the east side, it's not perfect. I actually own land, you know, a little ways beyond it. But it's a good enough marker because I don't think I'll be going much beyond that stone wall when I do things. But it's good to know where it is. So I didn't bother marking those two stone wall properties, I mean sides with uh, the property lines with the, the rope. But I probably will. So then I moved on to the property across the street because I own five acres across the street. Now one, there's two different lots, a 1.5 and then a 3.5. I've actually never set foot on the 3.5 lot, despite the fact that I've now been here for... I don't know, a couple years at this point, ish, maybe. I guess since I, fit, since I officially bought the place. So, but I've never been over there. So I was like, you know, I should really check it out. So I was following the boundaries. I didn't put, I didn't put any rope up. Um, I probably will go back and do that. Or maybe I'll skip it and go straight to posted no trespassing signs because as soon as I got onto that property, I saw something really weird. I found myself on a trail cam. There was a trail cam set up. There was a deer stand just a few trees away from that. And I walked, I followed a little deer path and there was a, there was a blind. So I was like, wait a second, where all this stuff, where did all this stuff come from? And I went back and forth and I was consulting my, you know, Google Maps and like the GPS and I was consulting the town, uh, the GIS database um, that the town provides, like that information on property lines. I was going back and forth and I'm like, this is on my property. Like the guy, there's a stone wall over there too, a rock wall, an old rock wall. And I'm sure the guy thinks that that's the edge of the property, but it's not. I own like quite a bit on the other side of it, including where all this equipment is. And I was like, I guess this stuff is mine. I could just take it. But I didn't want to be that big of a jerk. So I ended up after kind of mulling over it, I just wrote little notes and put it on all three pieces of equipment. And I was just like, look, I believe this is my land. I, you know, please remove you know, I know hunting. And I put it on there. Of course, the night after I did that, it rained. So probably those post-it notes are long since washed away into the wilderness. But, you know, I'm trying to let them know that because if they take it, if, the, if it's still there after hunting season is over, though, I'm, I'm claiming it as my own. Like, um, I don't know. I mean, it could, it could actually have belonged to the previous owner. I don't know if he was a deer hunter. I really don't know. So for all I know, it's abandoned you know, um, and it's on my property because it was from the previous owner of my property. So I really don't know the situation. I'm kind of hoping nobody claims it because I kind of want it because I'll, it means I won't have to buy a deer stand, a blind for turkey hunting if I choose to do that. Or I could really use another trail cam, to be quite honest. I'm having fun with my one trail cam, but I really, I'm just, I really would like to have another one for like other areas at the same time or different angles. So yeah, I hope nobody claims it because then I'm going to, I'm going to take it. <laughs> so that's the exciting adventure of marking my property. So again, I probably need to buy some posted signs so people don't hunt on my property. It's hunting season now. It's archery season here in the state. Um, so it's going to be another couple weeks, I believe, before shotgun season. And then it's a week of primitive firearms, and then we're done. Um, no rifles in this, this state, which I think is really weird. But anyway, that's on the side. So... Yeah. So yeah, pretty exciting. So what else did I do? Oh, I got my seeds from um, Baker Creek, that huge order I made. Basically, it's everything I'm going to be doing next year. I might get to pick up another couple packets here and there. I always do. But um, a lot of the focus is on corn, squash, and beans, like classic, like, you know, Native American fare, <laughs> because that's probably going to be a huge part of what I eat, like um, as my ways of eating change. And I focus on growing things for sustain, um, being self-sufficient or as much as possible, growing my own food, which is one of my goals of being here. I am um, focusing on things that I know will keep. So dried beans and like, well, maybe not so much the squash, but in some cases, like winter squash, we'll keep there in the winter, and like dried corn or like flower corns and things like that. That's a lot of what I'll be focusing on. A lot of what I'll be focusing on. So, uh... So yeah, so I got that. I also got some seed gar garlic from them. I'm still waiting on my seed garlic from Edible Acres, but from Baker Creek, I got two different kinds. And I'm excited I'm gonna plant that immediately um, in the, uh, the front, front yard garden 
the herb slash strawberry bed slash garlic and onion bed. I don't know, whatever. The thing out there, I'm going to plant those. And so they'll be coming up in the spring. So I'll get those out there. Um, and then whenever Edible Acres sends that stuff, I will add to it. And I think I'll have like six different varieties of hard neck garlic. So I'm super duper excited. I love garlic. Love it, love it, love it. So what else is going on? Oh, I collected some seeds. So I... I was excited to finally send out seeds for my patrons on Patreon, and I want to make sure I collected some seeds. So I got, I picked it from my garden. So I picked up, I got some indigo rose. I'm probably going to, probably not going to go with that tomato going forward. They didn't do well in this. They did, in my previous gardens and other areas in a slightly warmer zone, they did a lot better. They did, they never, they never did a whole lot. They kind of came back, but they acted really stunted most of the season. So it was kind of disappointing because that was always my like favorite tomato. But the blueberry cherry tomatoes have gone like gangbusters. It's like freaking me out how well they're doing. Not only did they like grow in less than ideal conditions, almost dying to death from like cold snap and weather extremes early in the season when I first brought them outside. Um, thought I heard something behind me. We have bear. I live in an area with bear and they, this is the season they come out and they get really brave because they're looking for food. So they come right up to houses and like, my beehive is right back there, so they'll probably try to go after my bees. So I'm very nervous about that. It's another reason why I need another trail cam. So I can watch out to see what's messing with my bees. But anyway, so I thought I heard something. So if a bear comes, I will be running very fast. But um, the blueberry cherries have survived everything, and they're doing amazing. And they're, like, taking over the garden still. Even though we've had a, a light frost, they're still going crazy. And it's like, I can't believe it. And the tomatoes are pretty tasty. Uh, very mild flavor. I like them a lot. So I collected a bunch of those. I think I still have seeds anyway, but I collected some just to have my own collected seeds and I'm probably going to be giving those away. I'm keeping some for myself for, for next season because I'll probably grow them again. Um, yeah, I'll probably. I'm sure I will. I'm sure I will. I really enjoyed having them. Though next year my focus is more on like smaller type of plants, which I'll probably get into another video. Maybe next year I'll talk more about it, but like more of bush varieties, but I, these get big. So, but I don't know. Yeah, I'll probably grow them. I'll grow them. I'll grow them. So I'm going to collect seeds for myself and I'm probably going to give them away to uh, patrons on Patreon. Uh, the, the particularly generous, gen generous patrons. Um, same thing with uh, Jimmy Nardello. Uh, I love that pepper and I collected some peppers from my garden and I'm saving some seeds from that. Um, I actually ordered more seeds from Baker Creek. <laughs> Jimmy Nardello to make sure I had enough Jimmy Nardello seeds. I also got a different kind, a slightly smaller sweet pepper. Because Jimmy Nardello can get huge. So if I want smaller sweet peppers, I don't really do bell peppers. They're not my thing. They don't grow or ripen up fast. They don't grow well or ripen up fast enough for me in this climate. So smaller peppers are better. Same thing with smaller tomatoes. Really smaller fruits in general. It's better to create a lot of small fruits here. So everything ripens up because you don't have a lot of time. That's kind of my advice for anyone in a cold climate. So, yeah, so I'm going to be saving seeds from that, and, um, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, actually, the last thing I want to talk about, now that I'm going on 23, 24 minutes, is, uh, and I won't edit a damn thing. It's just a long video. Enjoy it. I actually was going to try to focus on being less rambly and stay really focused so I could make this a shorter video, but hey, now that I'm only doing one video a week, why not have it 30 minutes long? So I've been moving around a lot of plants. So first of all, I moved my bush cherries. They were over on an edge that was really, that was the, so the trench I dug to try to divert water, they were right along it and they did okay. They did okay. But I wanted to plant things there, perennials there, because that's a, a row of perennials. I wanted to have something that would be really cool with the, okay with the water. So I moved the bush cherries over to interplant with my beach plums, which did okay. They didn't do amazing, but they didn't die. So hopefully next year they'll go crazy. So all those are in a nice little row. And the place where the bush cherries were, I actually planted the currants, the gooseberries, and the, and the yasta berries, which is just a gooseberry currant cross. Because they supposedly do really well in wet environments. So there we go. And What's also along that edge, after I remove the one remaining apple tree there, are my blueberry plants. And I'm probably going to put more blueberries there because blueberries also do... This is an area where... Well, 
The varieties I have will hopefully, this will hopefully be true, but generally speaking, blueberries do pretty well in kind of like this marsh area I have. I actually have tons of wild blueberries all through here. So I'm probably gonna leave the blueberries in that spot too, because they did okay. They did okay, but I don't know. It's rough. Um, next year, I'm hoping to do, once I clear more land, I'm hoping to dig a, a better stream through my property to drain better. So hopefully this won't even be a concern, but. And uh, I also took the grapevines that I have and I actually put them along the, I cleared out an area and actually planted them and the hardy kiwi vine I have next to the, the deck so that they'll grow up the deck and along the, the, the fence and over the gazebo. That's as part of the deck. So I did that because I was going back and forth because I'm like, I don't know where to put these stupid grapevines. And you really got to think about where you're going to put vines because they're going to be there forever. Or, you know, so you got to get them in a spot. So I think that'll be okay. I'm actually having somebody come to evaluate us for solar panels, like a ground mount. And that's one of the possible places I may have to dig them up again. And to be quite honest, I don't know if the grapevines are going to survive. They weren't looking great. But, like, they kind of gave up the ghost early in the season before it really started getting cold. But my Concord vine that I had last year, or a couple years ago, that did the same thing. And this year, when it came back to life, it just, like, like quadrupled in size. So I hope they're going to be okay. If they're not, big deal. They were just, like, cheap vines I got at, like, I don't know, Walmart or something like that. I can't remember where I got them. But they're just a couple of vines, or maybe it was tractor supply. You know, one of those, like where they just bring in a bunch of random cuttings and they're like, it's super cheap. So, yeah, so I moved a lot of plants around. I don't know if I have that much more to move. I have a couple chestnut trees, which are also tractor supply save. They were like dead. It was like a 90% off sort of sale because they looked dead, but I brought them back to life. And um, I think I'm just going to tra- plot those up. Um, yeah. Yeah, I got some more work to do in terms of like planting things other places and repotting things, but I'll talk about that later when I get around to it. Extra long video, because you're so awesome. All right, well, anyway, I guess uh, I guess that's it. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, thank you so much for watching. Uh, thank you to the, the Patreons who are supporting me on Patreon. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. And um, again, I'm posting all my extra videos on Patreon. So if you're interested in that and possibly receiving seeds from me every month or in more infrequently than that, you know, consider, you know, signing up and supporting me on Patreon. I really appreciate it. It is uh, uh, the one source of finances I have for my homestead right now. So it is very much appreciated. <laughs> very much appreciated. So thank you so much. And, uh, and always just thank you for joining me on this journey.